All right. I think we've got a pretty good capacity going right now, and it is 7.02, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Heather Cummins. I'm the Gallery Programs Coordinator for the Bell Museum, and I want to thank all of you for being with us tonight. Uh, we're so happy to be hosting this program, helping insects build their homes, and we're excited to thank our sponsors, the Farm and Food Alliance of Minnesota and MGK for their generous support in bringing this program to everyone tonight. Our program tonight focuses on supporting insects, crucial members of the environment. And I'd like to ground us this evening as we begin by acknowledging that the Bell Museum sits on the traditional lands of the Dakota people. This land from which I also join you tonight was reserved by the Dakota in the 1851 Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, and it remains sacred to them today. I would also like to acknowledge the Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe people, indigenous keepers of the lands to the north. Dakota and Ojibwe knowledge systems are crucial ways of knowing the land we now know as Minnesota. And at the Bell Museum, we honor that knowledge and the values embedded in it and we support the knowledge keepers who protect it. Our program tonight supports our current temporary exhibit, Bugs Outside the Box, which presents larger than life insect sculptures, each showcasing the hidden beauty within each of these many beasts of the natural world. Through this exhibit, we invite our audiences to get inspired and get outside, use your observational skills and learn about the insects you can find on our learning landscape and in your own neighborhoods. We have activities developed in collaboration with researchers and students at the University of Minnesota, as well as community partners like Jessica, um, to help you with getting to know the insects found here in Minnesota. We also invite you to visit the Dr. Roger E. Anderson Education Wing display to see specimens from the university's insect museum, learn about collecting tools, and watch the Bell's representative collection of specimens continue to grow as we wrap up this summer season. Our presenter tonight is Jessica Miller. Jessica is an entomologist and as owner of Dragon's Wind, she shares the wonder and fascination of insects and the services they provide to our own yards, neighborhoods, and other environments around the globe, transforming curiosity into knowledge and understanding. She uses current research and interesting facts to help you laugh and inspire respect for insects' behavior, heavy workload, and environmental needs. Jessica expertly bridges science, art, and diverse perspectives. Before I turn it over to Jessica, I just have a few notes for our audience. We're going to hold some time throughout and at the end for questions, so please go ahead and drop those into the chat as we go. Um, and if you are having technical difficulties, feel free to chat me and I will help you out with that as best I can as well. Um, as you've noticed, we have captioning turned on for our program this evening. And if you do not want to see the captions, you can hide them by clicking the live CC button at the bottom of your screen. And my apologies, we are relying on Zoom's uh, transcript feature tonight. So please bear with us. And without further ado, Jessica, thank you so much for being here with us tonight and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Heather, for a lovely introduction. I'm delighted to join you all tonight to share insects. And let's get this party rolling. Oop. Okay, I think we've got it up and running. What's the buzz? Bee nest. So I think Heather did such a lovely introduction. I don't have to talk too much about me and my business. <clears throat> but I, um, I've decided I want to be that fun table at conferences that I wish I would see. So I do some insect photography and puzzles and things. Um, I do events that are like 15 second fast movements with children. What's this? What's this? What's this? To um, I was a guest at a water conference and was allowed to talk for about five hours um, with a PowerPoint and photo presentation. Um, and the audience absolutely love that too. So wide range of ways to connect with people with Dragon's Wind and I sure have fun doing it. So I thought I'd start um, with some basic insect information um, that the body parts, uh, so insects have three body parts, the head, 
the thorax, and the abdomen. Um, on the head, you'll find the eyes, the antenna, mouth parts. On the thorax is where the wings and the legs will be attached. And then the abdomen um, has a lot of the digestive parts and reproductive um, organs and is frequently a little softer than the rest of it. There are two types of metamorphosis oops, of insects. And the first one is incomplete metamorphosis where like a grasshopper here hatches from the egg and the insect looks pretty similar to the adult um, but it's smaller and it'll grow larger and larger. And um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but then the wing buds will get bigger and bigger and then it'll become a fully grown adult with fully functioning wings. Um, then they can mate and lay some more eggs. Today's insects are gonna concentrate mostly in complete metamorphosis. So that means the eggs hatch into a larval stage the larva may go through lots of molts, a few molts, and then it will pupate prior to emerging as a fully grown adult with wings um, and then mating and laying more eggs. So, oops, um, the, so butterflies, flies, and hymenoptera, bees, ants, and wasps all go through this complete metamorphosis, which means they pupate. So, Insects, besides being an unending source of new information, a million insects at least and a million questions per insect, there's a lot of homework to do. So insects are predators, they're food or prey for other insects, birds and turtles, pollinators, some are pests, some are considered pests some places, some aren't pests in other places, sometimes they're just a nuisance, some are really cool and some are kind of gross. Insects like us need air, clean air preferably. And we know we've had some air quality issues this summer. And I would, I would bet we can connect the dots that uh, insects struggled with polluted air um, from fires as well. <clears throat> insects need water. Some insects get their water moisture from other insects they eat or nectar. Uh, and then insects need the food and habitat. And today we're gonna to talk about uh, habitat, building habitat, making habitat, and we can also connect that back to food as well. So a few of you came to the Bell Museum and picked up these handy dandy bamboo kits uh, to put together uh, nests for your hymenoptera to hang out in your yard. <clears throat> I had one in my house. This is a, a similar to the um, components in the kit seen uh, in the previous slide. Essentially, you want to put your bamboo sticks together. I guess I should slow down first. So if, as I may suspect that you are all savvy individuals and can make or find some bamboo or other materials, um, you might be ready to DIY a little bit of this. So if you see in this picture, you've got um, maybe eight inch, 10 inch bamboo stems. Um, I recommend trying a few different sizes, you know, get all experimental, get sciencey. And you cut them up at, at the node. So if you can see um, then that center picture on the top one, you can see the bottom of it. So that means that end is closed off. And then on the picture on the left, um, all of those are the open ends. Um, so you would cut them um, below the node. So you've got the open end and then a closed end. Um, and that makes the animals that will nest in there the most happy. So then essentially the photo on the right, uh, I think I had some masking tape wrapped around it and excellent. So the taped it, taped the bamboo pieces together, put a piece of rope around it. Again, what you've got in these kits is some twine. Um, and then you can hang it from trees um, or hang it from some other structures. I do warn against duct tape. I had my, um, I used a pipe cleaner and the duct tape failed. So the pipe cleaner failed and then it fell down into my driveway and then I drove over it. So watch out for duct tape. It's not as great outdoors. Um, when you, you could go ahead and hang the nest now. Uh, you can hang them in the spring. Um, the insects know what to do in all the kinds of weather. So um, whenever you are ready to hang a nest, have some fun with that. 
Now, I, I didn't have any hanging nests, or if I do, I forgot where I hung them, but I did have uh, two different structures with uh, bee habitat. So this is the first one. It was like a insect garage or something. Um, and I don't know if the pine cones and the wood chips did anything, but the bamboo definitely got inhabited. So here's a close-up shot um, of this. And um, in case you missed in the back picture, these are also really nubbly, like short sticks of bamboo. I think they're around three, they couldn't be any more than three and a half inches long, which I was surprised. But I it seems that most of these, or at least the four out of the eight in this picture are covered with, it looks like soil, it looks like the, the dark black soil in my yard. So they might all be the same species, um, but I'm not certain. Could be a different animal, same species, but that's one clue is looking at the different colors of these caps. So inside, I'll show a picture later on what's going on inside. But again, I was surprised that three inches was long enough. Now this is the second bee or um, insect nest. Uh, I think it was a store-bought one, you know, trying, trying to see what was out there, trying to see how things worked. You know, I, I get caught up in sneering at things. Um, so if you look on that left picture, if you see that big, huge, gaping hole of this monster bamboo stick. Well, nobody's living it, it's too big. Um, and oftentimes bamboo can be too big for insects to nest in. But if you look at all the other ones that are filled in, I, I think um, we're having more fun than I thought I was gonna have. And if you look at all of the different photos, there's a lot of different colors going on on the tips or the ends, the end cap, we'll call them, of these bamboo sticks, of these nests. So here's a close up. And so I just got so excited putting this presentation together because I hadn't looked this close. And so zooming the photos in was an absolute necessity for all of you to see as well. So uh, there's that lighter dirt that's definitely different color than that black dirt. Um, which I believe is a, a mud wasp. But then it looks like there's resin on those two below, what looks kind of like a, a beige sand. And then on the right side, those look like all kinds of different resins. And the one that has sort of a reddish bit on it. I mean, what what is that material even? So I, my, I'm inspired by um, the research I did for tonight's presentation. So here's just another close-up photo. I love seeing the one on the far left. Again, it's kind of a, a white color and it's really smooth. And then those resin chunks are just big chunky things. I'm, I'm so excited. So in your bamboo nests, um, however you assemble them, uh, I hope you have a lot of fun playing Discovery. And um, to go back to this photo, I had these hanging on a tree that I cut down. And so I just set them on my front steps. And not only is that a great spot for me visually, like I don't have to walk through anything to get to the tree to look at the stuff. It's right on my front steps and it's not social insects. So anybody coming and going, honestly, I think when I open the, the front door, it scares them off for a little while. And if I sit quietly, they'll try to go back to their nest building. So it's a, an activity I felt very comfortable with and they've never, these aren't these aggressive picnic ruiner insects here. So then um, one of the insects that might nest in these, I didn't see green tips or green end caps. Am I shopping end caps? Is that the right thing? Um, with leaf. So there's a leaf cutter bee. So I have circled the um, ash and the maple tree leaves because they have these little circles. No, I did not paper punch those. Bees cut them. So I've got all kinds of great clues in my yard that other insects are up to things. And the mega chylid or the leaf cutter bees do these wonderful, perfect circle holes. They roll them up like a paper, you know, like a your poster. 
And then they carry them to their nest and then they line them. And I loved it. Somebody called it lining it like a, a sleeping bag, making a leaf sleeping bag um, inside the nest. So then there's, so we, the kit came with the bamboo and if you have access or um, want to make them with bamboo, uh, I'm sure having fun with that. There's some other ways to make stick bundles. Um, and it's just from, I like to do it when I'm getting antsy in the spring and want to clean up my yard and know that I should just leave it like the nature would leave it. Um, and it's taking different stems. So these are just three pictures of different stems. The top right stem actually has a bee flying to it. It's called the Serotina bee. It's our local um, carpenter bee. So we don't have the big bumblebee looking carpenter bees. We have these little tiny cuties that nest in leftover stems. So um, all the plants that are gonna die this year, these insects will be coming out of last year's stems. And in the spring, they'll look for this year's dead stems to, to nest. One of the pictures, uh, the picture on the bottom right, it to me, I have an eye for this. I, I stared at stems for a summer. Um, has the look that it's been smoothed out by a bee. Bees have really strong jaws and they can smooth out that hole and then they crawl into it and nest. Now I'm a little less knowledgeable of which way to hang these. I like to stick them in the ground. So if I go tidy an area of the garden, um, I may, if I've got a six foot long goldenrod or Joe pie or something, I might even whack it into two or three lengths of stick and, and stick it in the ground. I put this in a pot and took a picture today um, and it, I may leave it there and see what happens. A couple of those are stems that I think have bees in them and a couple are stems that I think are empty. Um, you can also, besides sticking them in the ground, um, which I think ends up kind of looking nice in the, the garden, you can also tie them together with like a piece of yarn. I used red so it was visible. And so you've got a little bundle of sticks and then you can lean them um, upright against your garage or an outbuilding or a tree or something in case you want, if, in case your tidying of the yard needs to be uh, effective enough that you, you need to put it somewhere else. It's also kind of fun to bundle them up and give to friends or neighbors, uh, encourage them to have more cool pollinators and stem nesters in their, their gardens and yards. So then this beautiful slide shows you what they're doing inside of these stems. So whether they nest horizontally in, some of these would even be cavities in like a tree horizontally placed. Um, others of these may be the stems that are upright, like the top one, the pollen seems to be it seems like that would be on the bottom, but now I'm just looking at the photo too much. Um, essentially, whether it is a bee or a wasp nesting in these cavities, um, they have to provision their babies. So in these photos, these are um, bee nests. And so they put in a pollen mass or bee bread, which is pollen and nectar mixed together, stuff it in the cell, and then lay an egg on it. If you notice that towards the right on that upper stem or bamboo piece, there's less and less pollen towards the end. Those are gonna be the males and they're gonna be near the mud cap enclosure. And the reason for that is um, they usually emerge first, but if something were to happen and they didn't emerge, um, the, the lower egg, well, would be adults at this point, would chew their way through and they would eat through anybody who hasn't hatched above them. So risking the males for, um, at, towards the open end. Also, if a predator got in, they'd eat the males first. Let's see. And then again, same with the bottom picture in that stem. Um, the females are going to be those larger cocoons. Um, and then on the right side of that stem, those smaller cocoons will be the males. Females need to be bigger because they have to lay eggs. And so they've got to have a little bit more heft to have enough um, protein to, to fulfill their motherly duties. 
Uh, again, this is just that serotina going into the stem. Um, on the bottom left is, I believe it's a mint stem. And I was surprised, I think bees actually nest in them and they're very flimsy and weak and kind of go back to the nature faster um, than I had thought a bee uh, could, oh, could nest in, but I, I think I'm wrong about some things. All right, so that's the part of um, nest building. So I wanted to pause, see if there were questions, uh, if there was something that needed further explanation. Jessica, can you hear me? There, now I can hear you. Okay, um, I just wanna let folks know if you have questions coming into the chat, I apologize. I have lost all visibility on my end. <laughs> so um, I, as soon as the screen share went on, I couldn't see anything. And all I've got, Jessica, is your face in the slide. I'll try to <laughs> So uh, I'm not ignoring you. I just can't see what you're saying. Um, ah, Jessica, feel free to, if you can still see it. I can see the questions. chat. So let me pull that open. Let's see. Here we go. Are dragonflies dangerous to butterflies as predators? Um, probably, but it's part of the nature. Um, and even though we have our favorites in nature, dragonflies got to eat too. Um, and the other thing is there are some butterflies that as wonderful as they are in high populations can be uh, quite damaging to uh, whether you're growing crops or, or you know, your favorite flowers or something. And so sometimes dragonflies, if they're nabbing butterflies, maybe helping out populations. There's a lot of cross um, influence in terms of who eats whom and how they're, and how they're playing their roles in the ecosystem. A couple of my bamboo tubes are open all the way like a straw. Is that okay? So not so much, or um, I don't think they're gonna like to nest in the bamboo quite as well. You might try and stuff something in the end of it so you close it off. Um, the other way is like in those houses that I have, if you have a structure and you, you sh shrub the bamboo so it closes one end or it's at least a little bit more closed. Um, if they run out of bamboos that have closed ends, they might work hard and try and close off the end. Um, sort of like they add the cap on the, um, at the top or at the end, they might cap off the other, but it, that would expend more energy for them. Uh, best diameter, I think, I really think it's up to us to continue to be scientists because I, I would have guessed smaller. It seems like there's some pretty big ones that were okay. I think the big one that was empty um, maybe was three quarters of an inch. So maybe three quarters of an inch and larger is too large. Um, but really have, have fun, measure your tube, see which ones are the insect you like the best. Maybe a quarter of an inch is perfect for those resin insects. Um, somehow I want the resin ones to be bees, but I don't know that. Um, but I think in like I, the shorter one, so not even the diameter might be more effective in terms of different species. So the you know, I've got the three inch one that looked like all mud wasps. And then I had one that was just four inches longer and it had higher diversity. And I didn't check diameters, but um, there are some paper. Oh, sorry, I could repeat the questions too. Is there any place we can look up the diameters of the hole for the various bee species and what their preferences are, websites or books? There may be some scientific literature out um, that, that even may have been part of the study that I worked on. I, I will look into it and if I find it, I'll pass it on, um, pass that information along. Uh, protecting nests from hard rain. So um, what happens in the springtime when I'm cleaning out the garden, I'll leave the stems, like the vertical facing stems, you know, I'll, I'll break them off to levels that I think are appropriate. I think even anything, I think four inches, and then I like to leave 16 inches and taller, um, but that's my novelty. And 
what happens is often those plants will fill in and cover those stems that are out. And so those leaves will act as natural umbrellas um, uh, to protect nests from rains. Again, nature kind of does things in most of our animals are adapted to what our um, what our weather does. The other thing is like the bigger nests I have on my front steps, so they're not getting into the rain. So the little roof um, on it, if you're doing just the the bundles, um, there's no prevention other than that you're hanging it sideways and hopefully not pointed upwards, so the rain gets in there more easily. <coughs> Um, what are the best plants to leave? What are the best plants to leave stems in the spring? Uh, I guess I just keep leaving everything. Um, some again, some of the ones I wouldn't have suspected were more successful than I imagined, like the mints, maybe even mountain mint would be okay. Um, I think common milkweed isn't great because it disintegrates so or again, reverts back to nature or into the hummus fast. Um, and I also found lots of earwigs in. So I would, that one didn't seem like a great stem. Let's see. Um, yeah, I, I experiment what you have, try those first, um, get new plants, try those stems. So the social structure of the bees that will colonize the tubes is different than that of honeybees. We learn about Different from honeybees, we learn about as kids with a queen and a whole hive to support her. Can you discuss the social structure of these bees? I will in the next section. And I've read that the openings should face east or southeast. How do you keep them facing the right way when they're hanging from a tree or a post? Uh, again, I would recommend um, trying some different things. So the, the nest that I showed earlier in the bamboo in the little houses that faces west. Um, I think east can be helpful in the springtime because it gets the first sun and um, insects need a little bit of, of that solar energy to get going. Um, yeah, like you said, if it's, if it's spinning around willy-nilly, you can't make it face the way you want to. So I would, again, continue to experiment and, and try. A couple of tubes look closed on both ends. Will they be able to open one end? Um, they might, but again, it might expend energy that they um, would rather spend on an open stem. Um, so there's that. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go on to the next section. And, oops, there we go. So what, is the the animals nesting in these are in the order Hymenoptera. These are bees, ants, and wasps. And we're gonna leave ants out today, even though they're wonderful and fascinating, and talk about bees and wasps. So honeybee and bumblebee are social bees. Honeybees are social bees, and um, the way to define them is um, it's a queen. She's the only one who lays the eggs. All the other females are support staff to feeding um, the larva, to going gathering resources, to cleaning everything up. Um, the males are laid um, and only serve as sperm donors. And um, but the the organism is the whole hive. One of those is not the organism, it's everybody involved. And honeybees aren't native to, um, the, to North America. We do have them in Minnesota. Um, you would probably very likely to have them in your state as well. They're more like um, an agricultural commodity, more like a cow than really quite as much as our ecosystem, just there, they were introduced. Still pretty cool organisms and very helpful to understand many, many things. Then bumblebees are the other social bee we have in Minnesota. These are native. We've got, I don't know how many species, but many beautiful, beautiful bumblebees. Oh, 
and I forgot to talk about numbers. So if you can tell, bumblebees have a lot smaller colonies. So the colony, the, the big one kind of front and center is the queen. The rest are going to be um, likely females, again, doing all of the hive work. Later in the season, she lays males who then um, do the mating flight, inseminate the next year's queens. Um, everybody gets frantic and eats a lot because everybody's going to die except for next year's queens. But so, oh, numbers. So in this photo, I can see maybe 15 workers. So bumblebee colonies don't get huge. Honeybee colonies, so just in that one box on the left-hand side could be 7,000 or more honeybees in that. Um, the picture on the right, I don't know, maybe 500 on that frame. I'm just guessing. Um, so lots, lots and lots and lots. And if you um, know, sometimes beekeepers wear suits, especially if they're robbing the honeybees of the honey because they are protective and do not want you to steal the honey. And that's when things get real because one stings you and it sends out a stink of alarm pheromone and all of the other sisters um, that work and live in there know you're the enemy and they're coming after you too. I believe the same thing might be true for bumblebees, but there's just so much fewer of them. They would rather not fight you um, they can sting you and hopefully that'll make you go away. They can try to sting again because honeybees are the only ones that lose. They can only sting you once. They um, sting you, the barbs make the stinger stay in your skin and then it pulls out their guts and they do not live very much longer. Another cheery one are the papal wasps and yellow jackets, another social organism. Um, the picture on the left are these paper wasps that sometimes think nesting right outside your front door, back door, garage door, or all kinds of doors you'd like to go in and out of. Um, they have the open comb. They start off really small. I have knocked down a couple of really small ones that could almost be cute. By the time they're the size in this photo, maybe that's 15 or more sisters. Um, there's usually one alpha who does the egg laying and the rest of them work. Um, I believe there's, it's a little different than honeybees, but um, once it gets bigger and about this time of year, if that nest has gone unnoticed, it could be quite a few of them ready to defend it. And it, and it makes life really miserable um, trying to get them down. Hiring professionals is a very um, real choice. Um, if you have to do anything with them, you want to do it early in the morning when they're still cold and slow or um, after dark when they're cold and slow. But social, social wasps. So then the one on the right, not as great of a photo, I did take these off the internet, um, is in case. So that one is a bald faced hornet nest where they have the yellow or the paper covering on the outside of the nest as well. But still, starts off small, gets bigger and bigger by this time of year, um, running into them is not so fun. They are also, um, Heather and I were talking prior to the program about um, how the drought has affected insects and that we both have noticed um, and had more stories told to us about wasps being especially nasty this time of year. Um, this year, and it may be due to the drought and being thirsty. Um, it could be more insects desiccated, so there wasn't as many to hunt for the babies. But one of the other reasons these wasps get kind of cranky pants this time of year is they're, they're getting to be about the biggest they're going to get. The, the old queens aren't going to lay eggs anymore, so there's no babies to feed. They're out of work. They know fall's coming and they know all of them except for next year's queens are going to die. So they're, they're just cranky pants. And that's it. Those are the social naughty ones and they're not completely naughty. Wasps um, can do great pest management on your on crop pests and things. Um, again, honeybees can be quite aggressive if they think you're up to no good. But 
these are very, very few social bees and wasps. Oh, so now. Oh, <laughs> forgot I had the um, magically appear things. I hate bald faced, black faced wasps. They are large, aggressive, and drove other bees away from sugar water. Ooh, I bet. It's one, it's another one of those interesting things of the hierarchy. So if you ever take the time and are watching insects on flowers, uh, it generally looks like they get along, but they're all hanging around on the flowers. Um, and it's, it's, they're fine. But if you start noticing, sometimes bigger ones do chase away littler ones, or, or there is a little bit of um, aggressive, or I would say aggressive posturing, um, or the littler ones move along a little faster. If there aren't any other questions, I'll go ahead and move along to the next section. All right. So now, for the rest of them, so no more of these naughty social insects, and they're not what I'm having on my front steps. I would never want to have that on my front steps. Um, but solitary wasps and bees, what a great idea. So tonight, um, or getting ready for tonight, I started going through my wasp photos and boy, underappreciated. I, have, I had to rein in how many photos I added. Uh, so this photo is helpful by um, that wasp in the lower left. And you can kind of see that it has a very thread wasp. So its abdomen is kind of fat and its thorax is kind of fat. And then it has a very narrow attachment, um, a wasp waist. That can be one way to tell a wasp. They also usually have long antenna like this one does. I can't tell you if she's male or female. Um, the other reason I can't tell if it's male or female is on a flower. So wasps visit flowers pretty regularly for their own food. And that would include males and females um, that need to eat themselves. Like this pretty wasp right here. And the reason I use this photo is one, these are some gnarly looking big black wasps. Um, I think I had three different sizes in my garden. I believe they're th even three different families, um, definitely three different species. And as this insect goes deep into the flower for the nectar, you can see the pollen on her thorax. She's an all black insect. So that yellow coloring on her thorax between her where her wings are attached is absolutely pollen that the spotted bee balm wax on her thorax and then gets um, traveled to the next flower as she moves um, from flower to flower eating. Oh, I'm ready, quiz time. So with having so many amazing pictures of wasps, I thought I'd put together a little interactive. So in front of you are six photos. One of them is not a wasp. If you would like to guess, please put your guess letter in the chat. I'm gonna give you a minute or something like that. Oh, I'll give you a 30, 30 more seconds. We're getting some good guesses. Excellent. Oh, very fun. Well, if it was, ask the audience. The audience has it with statistically B. Well done. You passed the quiz. So it was B. And the reason for that uh, I'm trying to show in this photo is, um, first of all, no, you can't really tell, but it only has one set of wings. Wasps and bees have two sets of wings. Then these gigantic eyeballs. So if you look at this photo, it looks like the whole head is eyeball. And then the third give our third clue 
are the antenna. Now it's a little hard to tell again in this photo, but flies have different antenna and a little short um, for this insect. And then here's a picture in the top left. And if you look at the eyeballs, there's still like a, a good chunk of head in between where the eyes are, which actually is funny. There's more eyeballs, but not like in the fly. And I wanted to go back and show, oops. So top left, I believe, is a paper wasp. The B um, is the fly. C is some sort of cool wasp, and that would be a female with, she's got an ovipositor on her abdomen. D is a wasp that I should look up and learn soon. E, I believe, is the northern paper wasp with the red or with that spot on its abdomen. And F was just a cute one on my, what is that? The snowberry. <laughs> uh, I was just reading in the comments, top left is definitely a paper wasp. They have distinctive faces and each one has a unique face. I believe there is some facial recognition in wasps that they can recognize each other too. This is another picture of a cool wasp that I wanted to share with you. And I just, the long antenna. Um, it's not a very good example for the eyeballs because it looks kind of like it's all eyeballs to me, but those long antenna um, give me the clue for that. Oh, lovely. Yes, there's some great studies about it from the University of Michigan in terms of um, paper wasp face recognition as uh, the, I can't see your name, Lee was a grad student there and enjoyed learning about that. Uh, here's another one where I tried to zoom in to look at the eyeballs of this wasp. And I believe this wasp could be one that is nesting um, in my bamboo bee hotels or wa wasp and bees welcome. Um, this is a digger wasp. It's a bee wolf. And one of the things I just love about this is I have another set of photos um, with wasps in them. And I can't wait to look, learn more about them. This book by Heather Holm is what I'm going to go through these photos and figure out exactly what they are and what they're doing. Um, it's always good to have a resource and great photos and a well put together book. It's just so helpful to be more helpful teaching about insects. So I will have more knowledge about wasps as I continue to explore them. So now we did start talking about these bee, bee nests. So let's talk a little bit more about solitary bee pollinators. Um, I love this photo. This is another um, Heather Holm credit with the beautiful green metallic bees, the leaf cutter bees that cut those beautiful circles, mining bees, which may nest um, underground or in other areas as well as the plaster bees, which might be some of those resin. I don't know, I'm not certain. So earlier I talked about insects needing air, preferably clean air, water, preferably clean water, um, food and the habitat part that we were talking about. Well, what we can do some building, we can you know order bamboo from where it's grown. We can use some of the things um, that are native to our different areas. So flowers are food and habitat. That was some of the stem nesting. And if you think about the different stem nesting bees and the best way to think, or one helpful way for me to think about these stems, again, I like to futz in my garden. And so when I know I shouldn't be futzing, but I have to futz, that I break off the stems and leave them around. If you figure what happens in nature, it would be maybe snow falling, or like somebody asked about heavy rains. Those are the types of things that would break off these stems. So when I break off the stems, I'm actually increasing the nesting possibilities for these guys, for these, yeah, for these guys, guys and gals. Um, because nature might not break 
as many of them as I can make available. So that feels kind of neat that I'm doing a, a, a service um, as I tidy potentially unnecessarily. I would have to look further about Southern California uh, bees nesting in stems. I am, I do know more about Minnesota bees and their stem nesting. Um, again, I recommend trying some of your native plants. If they're prickly, use gloves. Um, but you might, you might be surprised at how quickly bees find broken stems um, if you have them there, especially if you've got other unbroken habitat or um, islands of, of native refuge where they can come from. So if none of my neighbors have bees when I make the habitat, it's um, harder to, to recruit them from further away. I, I don't believe um, stem nesters fly particularly far, but I might get, be getting into um, come on. into that too much. So another bee uh, we talked about earlier with the leaf cutter bee. So this is a picture there also called the fuzzy bellied bee. Um, it's because her hairs are going to be on the bottom part of her abdomen. If you can see my, I can't see my, if you can see my arrow, um, her abdomen has yellow on the bottom. Those are going to be the hairs that help her collect pollen um, so she can bring them back to her leaf sleeping bags <laughs> um, to provision for her eggs and for her babies, her larva. It's another picture of a, a leaf cutter bee. This one's on um, butterfly milkweed, Asclepias tuberosa. So then what I started really connecting Maybe some of the bees that pollinate the stems, the flowers that are on the stems that other bees go on, might be, you know, there's always a, there's coevolution, but then there's ecosystem services. So one bee may make the seed set the best on this flower that this other bee needs to nest in. And that bee is also good at pollinating another plant that's really good for monarch butterflies um, for the time of year that they need to um, have nectar resources. So this brings me into talking about bee tongues. So um, I talked about making nests and homes, but there might be work that bumblebees and maybe even honeybees do for our front flowers um, that help create the nests that other insects need. So this picture is a picture of a, um, I think they call it the, is this is the Ugg boot bee. She has kind of armpit hairs and hairs along her hind leg that collect the pollen. We see the bright yellow areas. Um, a lot of that's gonna be pollen specifically collected in those long hairs that, that let her keep it on. Um, but, the tongue I thought was so cool in this picture. And this is a, a flower that doesn't need a long tongue. She didn't have to, or from what I understand, she's not reaching way into the depths to get to the nectar. In fact, she might be even parading around more for the pollen than the nectar. And the reason I say that is she's so full of pollen. Then there's, um, this one also has pollen on the hind legs. Uh, this is a spring, B, I believe it is dependent on the Azizia flowers. Um, and the reason I like this is that seasonal um, thoughtfulness. So these are some spring bloomers. Um, so this helps bees that are provisioning nests, whether they're in a stem or in the ground, um, that it's helpful to think about flowers blooming all throughout the season. Um, this bee coming onto the Monarda, the reason I thought this photo was poignant is uh, she's not very shiny on much of her body, which sometimes can be a way to tell wasps. They're often a shinier one. This one's not. Um, a bee uh, has some, usually has some kind of pollen gathering receptacles, whether it's on her belly or on her legs or in her armpits. Um, so this one, that white on the back, on the hind leg will be pollen hairs. 
but she's going to the Monarda, that, that one that I had thought might be too weak of a stem for stem nesters. Again, I think I need to do some more experiments um, that maybe there's some, they really do nest in a, a bee balm or other um, seemingly annual stems. This bee is always, I just like to feature this bee because I think it looks like a little ragtag muffin bee. Um, so it's a mega chylid uh, and it's on a false sunflower. Are there any questions for solitary bees or solitary wasps or any other questions that um, anyone might have? All right. And this should be moving right on to the last, I think I've got one last section. Oh, I just wanted to um, empower you some with your detective skills. Oh, you're smart humans with many senses that you can use to connect to, um, explore, or think about, um, or even develop yard areas um, for insects. And as much as I thought these store-bought contraptions were going to be unsatisfactory, the pictures, I just, these are so much fun to me to see. And especially as I saw the wasps come up and um, I think they mixed the mud with their spit and then put them in the, to block up the holes. It was just really neat to, to watch them continually visit. Um, and I know it was the, the mud, the ones putting in mud that I watched the most, but I'm, I'm having so much fun that I put together this presentation for today that my detective skills have been um, impassioned because it's one of my favorite things about insects is it's, it's, it's a delightful way to do something super easy. I wanted a job where I felt like I was saving the world. Um, I wanted to save the Mississippi. Well, now I'm, I live off Minnehaha Creek and every little flower I plant is a benefit to uh, at least a few insects to add positive um, things into the environment. Uh, question, how long can you use those store-bought houses? That is a very good question. I'm gonna keep an eye. I think I've had them two or three seasons now. Um, and you do need to, you can yank out the stems or you know, yank out a, the bamboo and put new bamboo or just let it go. Um, and one way I've heard um, when it's time to let it go so you don't encourage rot or weird diseases and spreading you know, amongst other insects is to put it in a, once spring comes, put it in a box, but cut a hole so the light shines through the hole. And as the insects emerge from those, from those stems, they'll go find the light and fly away and they won't go back in um, to re-nest in those stems. Um, I think there's also something about like a 10% bleach solution they can use, but I think the trick is also now looking at all the variety here. You want to make sure they're empty. So right now I wouldn't, these are all fine and they'll be good till next spring. I assume they're not coming out before winter, um, but next spring I'll need to start keeping an eye because that's a lot of occupancy and I wouldn't want them to nest too many years in a row um, in the same nest. Ah, I didn't exactly cover the bee versus wasp in, um, in how to tell. So I'll, I'll go back through a couple photos um, and talk about how you tell bees versus wasps. And then the nine year, uh, a nine-year-old is asking, how long does a ladybug pupa take to hatch? That is a good question. I believe that is a really good question. I don't think, I think I have to say, I don't know. I could um, Google it, but um, I'm not gonna do that right now, but I will have that on my get back to that. So let's go to a little bit more in depth of bee versus wasp. So um, 
bees, like I was saying, have um, hair. Most bees have hairs that um, attract and store and retain pollen um, to use as provision for their babies in their nest. Wasps tend to be uh, shiny bodied. Let's go back to a... So uh, here's a wasp that has more of a shiny body. Now it has some hairs on its chin, um, but in general, wasps are, are sleeker. No, no, bees are more hairy. Uh, bee, female bees often have larger hind legs. What are some other good characteristics? Uh, wasps tend to have blocky heads, and but that's going to be harder to tell. And bees tend to have more rounded heads. Uh, bees also have a variety of tongue lengths, whereas wasps are going to be more um, jaw centric. I don't know if that's completely helpful. All right. Any final question? Oh, we got, oh, it's coming up on eight. Um, I hope that was helpful. Let's look at another one. So long antenna, uh, most bees, let's go to the bee photo again. Most bees aren't gonna have completely long antenna. There's a few called the long horned bees, which do have long antenna. Um, but they will never be that length. Um, they won't be uh, over the length of the body. I think I said that wrong. Wasps tend to have very long and thin antenna like this, and there's a few bees that have long antenna, but they won't have as long of a body like this wasp. Oops. All right, if there are not any further questions or comments, um, I want to thank you all so much for attending tonight. Um, I my sincere gratitude uh, for all that you do for insects and all that you can do tomorrow. If anybody's interested, please feel free to contact me. My email address is jessica at dragonswind.com. Dragonswind is D-R-A-G-O-N-S-W-Y-N-D.com. And if you're interested in joining for Bug Club, it will be Sunday, September 19th from 2 to 4 p.m. Thank you. Oh, and I'm going to make sure, whoops, I didn't miss any further chats. I'm happy to see more information about solitary bees. Thank you for the presentation. You are very welcome, Diane. Thanks for being here. Oh, somebody said they learned a lot. It was very interesting. I appreciate hearing that. All right. Well, thank you all again for being here. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Heather, thank you so much for hosting me tonight. I'm glad to share my passion of insects with you. Be well. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, and I am sorry that I have lost all of my buttons back here. <laughs> I don't know if you would maybe try unshare oh. the screen if I might get any back. Yes. Um, but uh, I, I do have a couple of answers for folks um, from questions that came through. So there was a question, I think you said, Jessica, about um, any stem nesting bees or solitary bees in Southern California. And I know UC Berkeley has an urban bee lab um, and they, I believe, have an entire web page that's devoted to um, common bees that you can see in the Southern California area. 
Um, and then there was also a question about lady beetle life cycles. It's gonna vary a little bit from species to species for sure, but on average, the larval stage, which you could think about as kind of like a caterpillar, um, that would be the equivalent in a butterfly's life cycle, is usually about a month. And then they take about 15 days or so to pupate. So that would be kind of like the cocoon stage for a butterfly. And then they can live up to about a year as an adult. Um, again, those, those times are gonna vary a little bit from species to species, but um, that, that's at least something for y'all to go off of. Um, and Jessica, this has been so much fun. It's been great to have you. Thank you for sharing your passion about insects and how to support them in our yards and our neighborhoods. Um, and we hope that we can see all of y'all at the Bell Museum. Uh, the Bugs Outside the Box exhibit has been extended um, cool. October 3rd. So you've got a little bit of extra time to get in there and see it if you haven't made it over yet. And with that, thank you all so much for joining us this evening and I hope we see you around the bell.